Today we are talking with Professor Henry Petrosky, a professor of engineering and history at Duke University and the author of a very interesting book on infrastructure called The Road Taken, The History and Future of America's Infrastructure. Welcome to Ridera again. Well, thank you. It's good to be back. Thank you. What is the book about? Well, the, the subtitle, The History and Future of America's Infrastructure, is effectively what the book is about. What I want to do is, by using history, explain, convey uh, the complexity of infrastructure. It takes, it's taken roughly a century to get our infrastructure where it was. Before the automobile, the truck uh, came onto uh, the scene, roads were used by wagons, horses and wagons, and this was a rather slow-moving kind of vehicle, and it could deal, the horses could deal with mud and all sorts of other things. But when the automobile came into existence, mud was its greatest enemy, you might say. And very often, ironically, uh, the, the automobile, which was supposed to replace the horse, had to be rescued by the horse because it got bogged down in such muddy, muddy roads. Appreciating something like that makes us realize that Technology does change, but at, at the same time, uh, technology change is a complicated process, and the latest technology is not necessarily a, a panacea for, for everything. Early paved roads came into being. In fact, another odd twist, I would say, is that the, it wasn't the automobile that pushed early paved roads to eliminate the mud problem, but, but rather bicyclists. Uh, around the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, there was a craze in bicycle riding. And uh, it was bicycle clubs and organizations who, who rose up and, and demanded, today we might say uh, lobbied for good roads and improved roads. And improved meant not mud, but some kind of gravel or more preferably, something like asphalt or concrete. Concrete at the same time was coming into existence as a paving material. And uh, uh, the, the automobiles benefited from, from this, but it, it would be short-sighted to say that they actually drove it uh, totally. So sometimes what seem to be simple and obvious answers to, well, let's talk about infrastructure problems, are, are not necessarily the, his, necessarily the historically correct answers. We went to a, a very significant and gigantic uh, push for the building of roads and bridges in the early 20s, or I think um, after the World War II, the pace also quickened up considerably. Would you trace a history of uh, how the roads and bridges came about? And sometimes the road not taken could also be <laughs> a problem, as you have a nicely titled the book based on the poem. Well, yes. The, well, the road not taken, of course, is Robert Frost's poem, and I rely heavily on that as a sort of a structure for the layout of my book. The chapter titles are taken from lines from Frost's poem. But I, I titled the book The Road Taken because, well, we've made decisions, and uh, uh, those are the more important ones than the roads not taken because we, we've left them behind. But, but anyway, uh, although the bicycle uh, riders were the driving force of early improved roads, once the automobile began to take off in the teens and the 20s, it was uh, it was they and, and uh, automobile manufacturers, especially, who who drove the uh, process for uh, demanding paved roads, and not only uh, good roads, but equally importantly, where they went. It was important to, to be able to travel from uh, the east coast to the west coast, let's say, or vice versa. And there was a very important turning point. Uh, at least for some people, and that was, I think it was 1919, uh, just after the First World War, when uh, the Army wanted to demonstrate its mobility. So it, it assembled a convoy that was going to travel from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco and uh, use the existing highway infrastructure, which turned out to be, well, inadequate, one might, might say. 
because it took them 60 days to make that to make that trip. And among the members of that convoy was a young Army lieutenant colonel named uh, Dwight David Eisenhower. Now, he, of course, later became president. And uh, when he did become president, our roads were still well wanting. There, there, there wasn't a national system of roads that was rational, let's say. Uh, there were lots of plans for them, and uh, there were lots of roads that, in existence, but they really went from state to state in, in, a, in a way that uh, the interstate system that we know today uh, has a more of a continuity across state lines. Uh, but so when when Eisenhower became president, that was one of his priorities. It was because he recalled his uh, experience with the road system from the uh, army convoy, and also during the Second World War, he experienced the European roads, in particular the German autobahn, which he saw as a potential model. So so uh, the the federal government, through acts of Congress, got involved. In a, in a much bigger way. They, they had been involved for some time in uh, funding roads, making grants and setting up regulations. But it, with, with, Eisenhower, with the Eisenhower administration uh, legislation, the uh, interstate highway system was put on a very rational basis. And uh, it was very tempting to the states to uh, accept the terms of the federal government, because the federal government was offering about 90 percent of the cost to build an interstate highway through or within their their state. And uh, this is the, the, the model that exists to this day, that uh, states who own the roads, they are actually the owners of the roads, the interstates, apply to the federal government for a grant to, let's say, widen an interstate or build a new bridge. Uh, across an interstate or whatever they they wish to do, and the federal government has uh, has funded that rather handsomely, out of a fund, and this is important is funding, a fund called the Highway Trust Fund that was established pretty much along with the legislation establishing the interstate highway system. And where does that money come from? Well, that money comes from the gasoline taxes that we pay at the pump. The federal gasoline tax today is 18.4 cents per gallon. That's the federal contribution. There are also state taxes and sometimes municipal taxes tacked onto that. But it, for some time now, for, for decades, literally, it's been inadequate for a variety of reasons. And one is that uh, technology has advanced and uh, we no longer exclusively have internal combustion engine cars. Now we have uh, uh, electric cars, we have hybrid cars, and those don't use as much gasoline. So that means they're not paying as much uh, tax. That means not as much revenue is going into this highway trust fund. And that means it's falling short of what is needed to maintain the uh, interstate highway system. There are all sorts of alternative plans that are, are being raised, but this is a situation that has uh, been going on for over 20 years, and I think we're going to see it come to a head very, very shortly. The uh, fact of the matter is that uh, there are signs that the federal government would like to get out of the funding of roads. They'll never own roads because the Constitution doesn't allow that, uh, and, and, and that's always been a complicating point. Uh, the federal government can put money in, but it, it can only do that. If the states don't want to take it, well, then so be it. The alternatives are uh, are several, as I, as I said, and uh, they're driven by the fact that these new technologies, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, don't use as much gasoline as internal combustion engine driven vehicles, and yet they take the same toll on the roads. They, they their tires wear the same on the roads and so forth and so on. The uh, alter one alternative that is likely to gain a great deal of traction is uh, an experiment that's going on in several states, uh, most notably Oregon, and that is for drivers, regardless of the kind of car they drive, to pay by the mile driven in that car over Oregon's roads in this, this case. And uh, this is believed to be a user 
fee that is fair. You drive on the roads, you, you, you do a certain amount of damage to the roads. Therefore, you should pay for the roads through this uh, system. I would guess that within five to 10 years, we're going to see this increasingly spread across the, uh, across the country. The, the problem uh, that the federal government has been having for some time is that it has been dealing in cross purposes. Uh, if you buy a electric or hybrid vehicle, you can get a, a tax credit on your federal income tax for that car, which encourages people to buy these vehicles that don't pay gasoline taxes uh, or pay highly uh, reduced gasoline taxes because they don't use so much gasoline. And at the same time, the government wants to uh, you know, keep its revenue stream going through the gasoline tax. So where we stand is, is, is going to be uh, uh, very interesting to follow. I, I've been trying to follow it for some time now. And uh, I think, as I said, over the next half or decade, full decade, we're going to see a transition from federal control to uh, more state control. The book offers a very engaging accounts of the history behind how the infrastructure came about, but the book, we are, we are primarily focused on the roads and bridges. We are not talking about the canals and we are not talking about the railroads, such as uh, other kinds of infrastructure as well. But you also trace the history of the uh, word infrastructure. Tell us a little bit more about it. It was not that much in vogue, even just as uh, early as the uh, last just 50, 60 years ago. Well, that's right. It ultimately comes from the, from the French. It has to do with uh, uh, military uh, support systems. And uh, in the, uh, oh, I think as late as the 80s, if I recall correctly, uh, newspapers uh, were in, not in agreement. Major newspapers like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal were not in agreement about uh, how familiar this word was to the reader. Uh, some of them put the word in quotes, others didn't. Some felt the need to uh, define it when they used it. But now I think it's it's gotten to be uh, pretty much a part of the language and, and people feel familiar with it. But feeling familiar with the word is not the same as fully understanding all of its, all of its implications. And I think in the case of, of infrastructure, only by looking at the, the history of it, the history of what what we've gone through, what a nation has gone through in uh, building up its its infrastructure from really rather primitive state to uh, what what we have have today is, is quite eye opening. Uh, although we have a rather sophisticated infrastructure today, and uh, although I've only focused on roads and bridges as sort of a paradigm for infrastructure generally, just to keep the book in a manageable length and at the same time be able to go into some depth on uh, those aspects of infrastructure. It, it can be rather complicated and, and not fully understandable without a deep uh, appreciation of its, of its history, that decisions don't come easily. There are lots of dilemmas faced in uh, making those decisions. And uh, it's only by appreciating those things that we, we fully appreciate the current debates that are going on and the, the difficulties that engineers, departments of transportation, local uh, boards, state uh, boards, transportation have to have to make to uh, keep our infrastructure in, in, in shape. No matter how good the infrastructure is at any given moment, at any given time, it is constantly being deteriorated by the traffic increasingly heavy trucks, different kinds of tires, different uh, modes of use, sometimes experimental pavement that doesn't work out but then has to be replaced. All, all these things complicate moving forward. You have uh, many examples, and the book has a lot of uh, details that people generally we take it for granted. Let us explore some of those infrastructure dilemmas, you know, starting from as little as uh, concrete versus asphalt or white versus yellow road markings or cantilever versus suspension bridges or even elevated highways versus underground tunnels. Yes, well, those are four good uh, examples uh, from the book. Concrete versus asphalt is a century old question. 
uh, generally speaking, asphalt is cheaper in the initial investment, but concrete tends to last longer. Anybody who owns a home is faced with this same dilemma. Uh, let's say they need a new driveway. Do they put a concrete driveway in or a, uh, an asphalt driveway? Everybody knows which is better, which is more durable, but sometimes there are factors that, that affect the decision, such as, oh, I'm going to sell this house in, in, a, in a few years. Uh, why should I put a concrete driveway in? I'll put the cheaper asphalt in. It'll still look good when I want to sell the house. And the analogy in the government's ownership of a road might be that the, uh, the politicians who are facing that decision uh, know they're going to be up for election in several years, or they might be retiring, and that will go into their their decision. With regard to uh, cantilever versus suspension bridges, this is another uh, dilemma that goes back over a century when it was uh, time to uh, build bridges across long or wide spans of water like the uh, Hudson River in New York, uh, between New York and New Jersey, uh, about 3,500 feet uh, was the size of bridge that was needed there, and no suspension bridge had been built that long, but this cantilever bridge seemed to be an alternative. That's a bridge that doesn't rely on cables, uh, the kinds of bridges you see where the steel members go in all sorts of X's and crisscross ways that's technically called a truss. Those types of bridges were, were generally faster to build. They were uh, stiffer so they could carry railroad trains more readily. And uh, the decision became complicated. But then the, the, uh, the resolution was made by an external force, and, and that was the collapse of a very significant cantilever bridge when it was under construction in Canada. And uh, that gave the uh, the form a bad name, and uh, since then, uh, suspension bridges were pretty much the bridge of bridge of choice for long spans. So there, an external force becomes uh, very important, and something like that is very difficult to to predict. So, so dilemmas are are very important. As far as the the yellow line, we have a very nice system in the United States, I think. Whereas, if we are driving down a highway that is either a U.S. highway or interstate highway, the, there will always be a, a solid a white line to the right of, of us and of the, the road, road edge and a solid yellow line to the, to the left separating our direction of traffic from that oncoming. And in between, there would be these dashed lines of white for separating the lanes. Now, this is very important because it, it tells us, uh, as, as we become accustomed to it unconsciously, whether we're going in the right direction, what the rules of the road are, and so forth and so on. And uh, just as an aside, as we talk increasingly about autonomous vehicles, vehicles that drive themselves, this kind of order is extremely important so that the automobile uh, software intelligence will be able to uh, make those same uh, recognitions. And this is where the federal government does play an extremely important role, in my, my opinion. By requiring states adhere to that kind of uniformity, and then the way that government can do that is by saying, well, if you apply for a grant, but you're not going to paint your lines the way we say they should be painted, we're not going to give you the money. So that's a, that's a good kind of regulation that is enforced by, well, you could say, both a carrot and a stick. And uh, it, it, it helps the driver crossing the state line not having to recalibrate what, what these lines mean. And there was a time when that, that, that was the case. There was a time when Oregon, for example, didn't, didn't want to conform to the federal regulations of color for line, lane markings. And uh, they had big decisions to make about, the, whether, about whether they were going to give up the federal funding or, or, or not. And we see uh, decisions like that having to be made by states even even today. So so, uh, but but that decision uh, uh, had to evolve over literally decades, roughly uh, a half a century, let's say. 
because there are tentative starts and stops and reversals and and so forth, as as there are with with many kinds of regulations. So dilemmas like that, on the one hand versus the other hand, are 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 legion in infrastructure, as they are in any aspect of engineering or technology or or politics for the, for that matter. The United States has more than four million miles of roads and bridges, and we all know the consequences of neglect of infrastructure or generally it leads to the lost time in repair and higher fuel costs. Of course, there are estimates available all the time to us, but uh, these dilemmas that you bring up, they do have a significant impact in the kind of infrastructure we end up having, and it also changes the dynamics of commerce, it changes the dynamics of uh, convenience. I mean, some of the highways and bridges, uh, highways primarily, that were built just about 70, 50 years ago, they were state of the art, but today they are designed, they are not appropriate for the vehicles that move so fast compared to just uh, 50 years ago. Yes, well, all bridges and all roads are designed by engineers for a specific kind of traffic. And that means that uh, the engineers designing these facilities say, okay, what is the heaviest truck, for example, that's going to be using this? How frequently are these trucks going to be using it? That's what they usually refer to as traffic count. And uh, that goes into decisions about what kind of steel to use or what kind of concrete or asphalt to use. And uh, that, in turn, goes into establishing the lifetime of the bridge. And uh, these decisions are not linear, but uh, sometimes you start with the lifetime. The, the uh, people paying for the bridge, which might be the uh, State Department of Transportation, might say, we want a bridge that's going to last for 50 years or 75 years or whatever. And the engineers will work back from that. But all these things have a lifetime. They, 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 they are not expected to last forever. And the, that means that they're going to have to be re, repaved or rebuilt uh, at some time in the future. And that, that would be fine, and everything would probably work smoothly. And there could be rational, long-term planning for maintaining the infrastructure. Uh, budgeting long-term would be rational. But what, what complicates the matter is that neither engineers nor departments of transportation controls how much growth there's going to be. And uh, ironically, or paradoxically, perhaps would be a better way of putting it, when you build a new road or a new bridge, you promote development, and uh, that means more traffic. So although a bridge or road might be designed for 20,000 vehicles a day, might suddenly find itself carrying 50,000 or 70,000 vehicles a day. Well, that means that the deterioration of the piece of infrastructure is going to move at a much faster faster rate. The uh, fact of the matter is that uh, also legislatures in states set the rules of uh, how heavy a truck can use the highways. Engineers don't do this. Technical people don't do this, but politicians do this. There was a case in Maine, for example, where there was a, a bridge that connected counties of Waldo and Hancock, hence it was called the Waldo-Hancock Bridge. And it was a suspension bridge, and uh, it was found to be deteriorating at a faster rate than expected. And uh, that was due to a number of factors, some technical, but some due to the heavy traffic, heavy truck traffic, because it was the it was right on Route 1, which is a major uh, yeah. coastal route up, up there. And uh, increasingly, uh, trucks were... Uh, getting heavier and heavier. And even as this bridge was having this trouble, the state legislature was considering increasing the weights of trucks that could, be, you could use the highways from 90,000, I recall, to 110,000 pounds, if I remember correctly. The uh, bridge was finally uh, uh, stiffened because closing it uh, meant that uh, traffic, trucks and cars, uh, would have to go 60 miles out of their way to cross the river, the Penobscot River that this bridge spanned. So there, were, there was an urgency to make the bridge stronger so that the cars and trucks could still use it. But that was only a sort of a patch, we might say. It, it wasn't a permanent solution. Uh, in the meantime, a, a 
replacement bridge was constructed beside the old bridge. And that, of course, takes years. Once that new bridge opened and it was designed to take the heavier, heavier loads, then the old bridge was taken down. And that's why I speak of that Waldo Hancock Bridge in the past tense. It no longer exists. Once it was a, a civil engineering landmark, now it, uh, you know, it just is not there. <laughs> So, so uh, it's it's not only a technical issue, but a political issue, and uh, I think that also is uh, sometimes forgotten when it comes to questions of of infrastructure. And I think the debate will continue as we uh, look to develop or repair and maintain a lot of infrastructure in this country that has fallen by the wayside, and and people are paying the heavy price for in lost productivity, and businesses are suffering as well along the way. Well, that's right. The the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, issues a report card on the nation's infrastructure every four years, and the latest one was just issued about a week or two ago, and. Uh, the overall grade for the nation's infrastructure, if I remember correctly, that the uh, ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineers, gave the infrastructure was a D plus. If I'm, I'm, I'm looking in my book because I have a table on this. Yes, a D plus. That's the overall grade. And uh, that's not very good, of course. <laughs> that's the same as it was in uh, the previous report from 2013. So in the four years since the last report, in the eyes of the American Society of Civil Engineers, the uh, infrastructure has not improved in any significant way, if at all. Now, how do they arrive at grades like that? And uh, you know, they, they, they also give grades for the, uh, separately for bridges and roads and other things and uh, other aspects of infrastructure. They're about a dozen and a half categories total. So it's like, you know, taking courses in college and then you get a grade point average and that's what the D plus is. That's the grade point average. Um, and in many schools that would not be sufficient to graduate. Now, how do they arrive at these grades? Well, uh, well, there are, there are tests. If we're going to speak metaphorically and those tests involve not only the condition of the road, does it have potholes, but, also, is it of sufficient capacity uh, to carry the traffic that wants to use it? If if not, then that lowers the grade. Other questions uh, would be, uh, you know, how is it maintained? What about traffic jams? If the capacity is inadequate, then there will be traffic jams usually during uh, rush hour. What is the implication of all those people sitting in all those vehicles uh, not moving faster than maybe five miles per hour. Well, uh, for one, there's a lot of noxious fumes coming out of those vehicles that has implications for the environment. Uh, there are a lot of people that are not doing productive work. They're not at their jobs. Maybe they're going to arrive late. And the ASE tries to calculate this, and all that goes into these the, these these grades. Now, of course, there are some subjective measures uh, involved here, but presumably if, uh, you know, you have some consistency from one four-year report to the next, one, you know, semester to the next, then the grades are meaningful. And uh, it's, it's not a pretty picture. It's not a very optimistic picture, I guess we, we'd have to say. And the cost of bringing the roads up to just acceptable standards, which would mean what, like a C, <laughs> would... It's in the trillions of dollars, literally the trillions of dollars. Not one trillion, but trillions. I hope the politicians uh, listen to you and read the book and probably make better decisions along the way and, and put aside differences and get things moving faster. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Petrosky. It was a pleasure to talk to you again. Uh, and please do keep us in mind when you have another book. Well, thank you. I will. Thank you.